want you to imagine that you are a machine, that you are a machine in a factory, that you're a machine in a factory in 1912, <laughs> and you are loud. Let me hear you. You guys are machines. Let me hear those machines. Come on. In 1912, in Lawrence, Massachusetts, tens of thousands of people worked in the textile mills. Industrial, oh, oh, there you go, okay. Hello, industrial mills uh, were one of the first places uh, um, uh, that masses of people worked with new technology. Uh, these mill factories were deafeningly loud. The air was full of cotton dust. The machines were fast and dangerous. The workday was at least 12 hours, and the poverty wages meant that they had very little to eat. These folks lived on bread, molasses, and beans in dangerous and crowded tenement apartments, also owned by the mill companies. Most of these jobs were held by immigrants who had come to the U.S. in pursuit of a better life for themselves and their families. Half of the workers in the mills owned by the American Woolen Company were girls between the ages of 14 and 18 years old. Many were younger. On January 1st, 1912, a new Massachusetts law reduced the maximum number of hours women and children could work per week from 56 to 54. But the machines were sped up so that production did not diminish. Yeah. Ten days later, workers discovered that their employers had reduced their pay to match the reduction in their hours. That difference in wages equaled several loaves of bread. It was the weavers uh, at the Everett Cotton Mills who, when they realized that their employer had cut their pay by 32 cents, stopped their looms and left the mill shouting, short pay all out, short pay all out. Workers at other mills joined, and within a week, more than 20,000 workers were on strike. A strike committee made up of two representatives from each immigrant group in the mills was formed. Meetings were, tr were translated into 25 different languages. The committee put forward a set of demands, a 15% increase in wages for 54-hour work week, double time for overtime work, uh, no discrimination against workers for their strike activity, uh, and the organizers from the Industrial Workers of the World came to help. Children of strikers were sent to live with the supporters in New York and other East Coast cities. The strike was becoming dangerous. It was winter time, and it was very cold. These dramatic events from 100 years ago raised many important questions. What were working men, women, and children to do when faced with the dangers of industrial production? What was it like for whole families to work such long days? What was the immigrant experience at the time? And how do these experiences relate to what workers face today? We've gathered a number of stories to paint a picture for you. We start before the bread and roses strike and end long after. A hundred years ago, workers served machines. Many were killed or injured. Today we serve machines, fewer are killed or injured. This is the story of a worker from the Candleton Cotton Mill in 1864. My name is Hannah Lee Reed. I'm 12 years old and I work as a bobbin girl here at the Candleton Cotton Mill. I guess one mill is pretty much like another. This one's got 309 workers, 231 of them are women. Back home in Roswell, I work from 5 a.m. in the morning till 7 p.m. every day except Sunday. I'd get, up half, I'd get half an hour to run home for breakfast between 7 and 7.30, and again for lunch between noon and 12.45. Up here I get to work from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. I get paid $2 a week. My job as a bobbin girl is to sit here with my bobbin box at my feet and watch the spinning girls up on the third floor. It's too noisy in here for me to hear them calling for more bobbin, so I just have to pay attention to their hand signals. Then I run the empty bobbins up to those that need them. I work about 15 minutes out of every hour. The rest of the time I read my ABC book or I knit on my stockings and mittens. Mama always says she'd hope that someday I'd be able to work up in the mill office, keeping the books, but I don't suppose there'll be much chan chance of that. 
there aren't any women up in the mill office. I reckon I'll go on to be a spinner myself, making thread, or maybe I'll be a drawing girl, setting the patterns. Most boys who work out at the mill start at the age of 10 or so. They might go on to be mechanics or even carpenters. In 1912, to keep them safe, strikers sent their kids away. In 2012, with parents deported, kids are forced to stay. This letter was written by African-American washerwoman to the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi in 1866. To Mayor Barros, Dear Sir, at a meeting of the colored washerwomen of this city on the evening of the 18th of June, the subject of raising the wages was considered, and the following preamble and resolution were unanimously adopted. Whereas, under the influence of the present high prices of all the necessaries of life, and the attendant high rates of rent, we, the washerwoman of the city of Jackson, state of Mississippi, thinking it impossible to live uprightly and honestly by laboring for the present daily and monthly recompense, and hoping to meet with the support of all good citizens, join in adapting unanimously the following resolution. Be it resolved by the washerwoman of this city and county that on and after this date, we join in charge charging a uniform rate for our labor. And anyone belonging to the class of washerwoman who violates this shall be liable to a fine. We do not wish to charge exorbitant prices, but desire to be able to live comfortably from the fruits of our labor. We present the matter to your honor and hope you will not reject it. The prices charged are $1.50 per day for washing, $15 per month for family washing, and $10 per month for single individuals. We ask you to consider the matter on our behalf, and should you deem it just and right, your sanction of the movement will be greatly received. Yours very truly, the washerwoman of Jackson. Jim Crow is the law of the South. Former slaves worked the land. No factory jobs for them. From most unions, they were banned. Samuel Gompers was the first president of the American Federation of Labor starting in 1886. He held that position until 1924. In 1906, he made the following statement on why married women should not work. In undertaking to answer the question as to whether the wife should help support the family, I take it that what is meant is the wife of a mechanic, a laborer, a workman, not the well-to-do or the fairly well-to-do, for among them there is not even the false pretense of necessity. Taking then my conception of what is implied by the question, I have no hesitancy in answering positively and absolutely no. Imagine the wife leaving her home and children unprotected and cared for during the working hours, which among women generally are much longer than the workday of men. It is not for any real preference for their labor that the unscrupulous employer gives work to girls and boys to women, but because of his guilty knowledge that he can easily compel them to work longer hours at lower wages than men. It is the so-called competition of the unorganized, defenseless woman worker, the girl and the wife, that often tends to reduce the wages of the father and husband. I contend that the wife or mother, attending to the duties of the home, makes the greatest contribution to support the family. In 1912, few unions were open to women or people of color. Today, the labor movement is led by a woman of color. These are the recollections of Josephine Nicolosi, a survivor of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in New York in 1911. I worked on the eighth floor and I made blouses. I worked about 18 months before the fire. That day, the pay envelopes were given out. The bell was ringing to go home and I was getting up. I worked near the cutting table. A little match was burning on the table and Sal, the cutter, he hollered to me, is a fire. He used to joke all the time, so I said, you are always fooling, it is only a little bit of a match. But he took the pail, one of the red pails of water, and threw it on the match. All of a sudden, as he threw the water, the flames shot up like an explosion. Right away, the place was filled with fire and smoke and everybody was running around. I ran to the window and I was about to jump, but I had not enough courage. 
The girls were standing there hollering and crying, and many of them said, we can jump, they will catch us down there, but I went back from the windows to the door. When we came downstairs, the firemen were not there yet, but the first thing we saw were girls lying on the sidewalk. We thought they had fainted, and one of my girlfriends said, thank God, we are not like them, we're all right. She went over to one of the girls lying on the sidewalk and bent over her, and she was hit by another falling body and killed. At Triangle Waste, they jumped to their deaths, escaping the smoke and fire. At Foxconn in China, they jumped from the roofs because their existence is dire. This story is the Bread and Roses strike itself in 1912. Two years ago, I came to this place where so many of my people are and where I have a friend. I got work in a factory making underskirts, all sorts of cheap underskirts, like cotton and calico for the summer and woolen for the winter, but never the silk, satin, or velvet underskirts. I earned four fifty per week and lived on two dollars a week. Badly as our workmen and mechanics may be treated, it is no secret that the condition of women who are obligated to work for a living is far worse. I get up half past five o'clock every morning and make myself a cup of coffee on the oil stove, ate a bit of bread and perhaps some fruit, and then go to work. At seven o'clock, we all sit down to our machines, and the boss brings each of us a pile of work that we must finish during the day. The machines go like mad all day because the faster you work, the more money you get. Sometimes in my haste, I get my finger caught and the needle go straight through it. Spooling is very hard on the left side of my arm. When we're sick, we're docked for wages. When we're tired, they take a day's pay. They hire a man especially for this purpose. He rides to house to house to find out what is the matter with us, to urge us to rise. And if we are literally not too sick to move, they hound us out of our beds and back to their looms. So we must be careful as well as swift. In 1912, women and children worked for poverty wages. Today, almost one-third of households headed by single women live in poverty, double the national average. We want bread and roses, too. 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 This is the story of an immigrant woman a domestic worker in the 21st century. I became a domestic worker because my family was poor. I didn't have a good education, so I had no choice. My father is a farmer and furniture maker. I have a big family with six brothers and one sister, all younger than me. There were no real jobs at home, so when I was 15, my neighbor took me to Jakarta and found a job for me. In Indonesia, Housekeepers worked from morning to night. I was the cook, took care of the children, and shopped for the groceries. It was very painful leaving them behind. The family I was going to work for said they would take care of everything. I asked them how much the wage was in the United States for domestic work, and they told me $250 a month. I believed them. In Indonesia, that's about 500,000 rupiah, which is a lot of money. But when I got there, the family said they would only pay me $100 a month because they had to pay for the passport, the ticket, and everything else. This work is the same as it was in Indonesia. I don't know the way people work in this country, so I just did things the way I did them in Indonesia. I began working when I got up in the morning and worked until it was time to go to bed at night. That was my life. In 1912, immigrants came seeking opportunity. Instead, they found starvation wages. In 2012, what's what changed? These stories describe a lot of suffering and pain, but they also show the strength and determination of these working men, women, and children. They did not accept the conditions of their lives. They fought back, and they wouldn't settle for mere subsistence, just for their bread. In Lawrence, on March 1st, 1912, mill owners offered a 5% pay raise, but the workers rejected it. And then, on March 12th, the American Woolen Company agreed to most of the strikers' demands. The rest of the manufacturers followed suit, as did other textile companies throughout New England, anxious to avoid a similar strike. The children who had been taken in by supporters in New York City came home on March 30th. These workers went on strike to demand the basic necessities of life, the bread, but also the sweetness of dignity and respect, roses. They marched and they sang and they won, 
and they became inspirations for us still today. Marching in the beauty of the day, a million darkened kitchens, a thousand mill moss gray, are touched with all the radiance that a sudden sun discloses for the people hear us singing. Our stars. 